You guys stay put. Andy, good to see you. Go good on in. Good to see you too. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Are this, you ready for your 73 questions? I am, I am ready, and so are the two, two kitties here. <laughs> you guys stay put. Come on, this is Murph and Molly. Come on in, in this way. Probably meet them later. Murph and Molly will be around a lot, yes. All right. Um, can I get you something to drink? Um, water would be great. All right. Well, welcome to my home. Thank you, thank you. This is uh, my getaway from the hustle and bustle of the hospital. There you go. Water's okay? Just yes. plain bottled water? Perfect. Okay. Thank you. There you are. So what, what exactly are we going to be doing? What's the, the, the general format today? So we are going to be asking you 73 questions all about your life as an attending physician, as well as some more fun little questions for the people to get to know you better. Cool. That sounds good. Right. So let's get started. What's okay. your name? Uh, my name is Jim Wild. And what's your specialty? I am a pediatric emergency medicine physician. I am also a pediatric infectious disease physician. So how many years have you been practicing? Mm, um, I graduated medical school in 84, so this is now 36 years out of medical school. Okay. And where did you go to medical school? Indiana University. An undergrad? I was a Duke University undergrad. And did you take any gap years before going to medical school? No, I, I actually uh, considered it. Uh, and uh, when Indiana heard that I wanted to take a year and just kind of find myself, they said, fine, reapply next year. I said, yeah, I don't think that's a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds about right. So what was your favorite part of medical school in Indiana? Favorite part of medical school? Um, I, I really enjoyed anatomy class. Um, I, I was always impressed that people would donate their bodies for something like that and, and I'm incredibly grateful for the people that do that. But I just thought it was fascinating to just see how the body works, to see how it all gets put together. That's awesome. What so what specialty did you think you were going to go into on your first day of med school? First day of medical school, I was a blank slate. I, I truly did not know what I was going to do. Um, I started drifting towards orthopedics and was pretty hot on orthopedics going into my late junior year and uh, got talked out of it uh, basically from my surgical rotations in junior year. Uh, so. What, was there anything specific besides that surgical rotation that changed your mind from orthopedics? It was mostly seeing what the life of a surgeon is like. I decided this is not for me. I did not want to go down that road. I didn't want to have to be trained that way. I didn't want to have a lifestyle like that. I thought, no, I'm not going to do this. <sighs> Understandable. So, Were there any specialties that you immediately came in and said, absolutely not for me? From the first day of medical school, no. Um, I think that uh, once I got into my rotations, um, I was really not enthralled by psychiatry, partly because I was decked twice by my patients, two different patients, and didn't really, and the funny thing was that one of the nurses after the second decking said, you know what, I can just bet you're going to be back as a psychiatry resident in a couple of years, and I said, I can bet that you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Now that you did decide on emergency medicine, mm -hmm. what made you first fall in love with the specialty? Well, it's funny. I was going to do straight emergency medicine. At the time, it was a brand new specialty. And I was talking to my advisor about this. And, and basically, the, the thought at the time was, look, it's a brand new specialty back in 84. Uh, you might want to think about getting training in, an, in, a, in a, a specialty area first and then come back to emergency medicine. And I thought that that was probably not a bad piece of advice. And at that point, I had kind of gravitated towards pediatrics, and I thought, you know what, yeah, let me get, let me get a good grounding in a specialty area like pediatrics first, and then decide what I'm going to do after that. So I decided for, on pediatrics in part because of that. Okay. How long does your training take after med school? Well, for me, it was three years of pediatric residency, and at the tail end of my pediatric residency, I knew I was going to do a fellowship. I wanted more subspecialty training, and I decided on infectious diseases for a lot of reasons. Spent four years in infectious disease fellowship um, and decided just about towards the end of that that I didn't want to stay in a lab for the rest of my life. And it was really what it was looking like for, to me. So I decided to go back to my first interest, which was emergency medicine. So I did a pediatric emergency medicine fellowship. And so I did, ended up doing two fellowships. So it was four years of medical school, three years of residency, four years of infectious disease, two years of emergency medicine. So it was a long road, but I'm, I, I have no regrets about it. 
Did you plan on doing any other fellowships before you decide on infectious disease? No, infectious disease was, was kind of a major interest of mine. I had done uh, quite a bit of time in uh, missionary work, and especially in Africa as a medical student. And I, I was extremely interested in infectious diseases. And so when I decided it was time to make a decision on a f fellowship, infectious disease just seemed like a natural area to go into. And I, 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 I've loved infectious diseases ever since. Even though I'm primarily in pediatric emergency medicine now, I still feel like, like I'm one of the infectious disease people. All right. I'm going to top out this tea, if you don't mind. Of course. Um, so, how... Let's see... Did you ever consider any other degrees, such as an MBA or an MPH at all? Yeah, I did. I, I considered doing the EIS, um, Epidemiologic Intelligence Service at the CDC. Uh, it was probably because of my infectious disease years. So EIS officers basically are trained as public health people. And some of the EIS officers stay with the CDC, uh, which I thought would be kind of cool at the time. And um, most end up in public health departments around the country. And I just, I, again, I started gravitating away from ID towards the end of my ID years and thought, no, let's, let's just go back to e emergency medicine. It's, it's time to go back to my first interest. So the EIS fellowship never happened. It would have been fun, but, but it never happened. So what would you say is the most unique part of your specialty as a pediatric emergency medicine doctor? Most unique? Um, well, it's totally different from the other specialties in peds in that um, we um, are kind of looking at everything under the sun, including true emergencies, which thankfully is not most of the job. Uh, and we're looking at regular run-of-the-mill office type things as well. Um, we're the front door to the hospital. Uh, we bring in most of the patients that are, end up as inpatients. Um, we are the folks who talk to parents who have just lost a child. Uh, death in the ER is not a common thing in the pediatric ER, but it does happen. Uh, that, that makes us quite a bit different from the other pediatricians. So there's, there's actually quite a few facets of my subspecialty that make us different from the other pediatricians. So what would, what are, wow, why should someone choose your specialty? They should choose my specialty if they are attracted to it. The thing about choosing a specialty or subspecialty is that it really needs to fit your personality. And there, there's really no best specialty or best subspecialty. It's what matches your personality, what matches your interests best. And so what you should be doing during your medical school years is looking at the various specialties and subspecialties during especially your junior and senior year and trying to figure out what is the best match for you. I think I could have been happy in just about any specialty uh, with a couple of possible exceptions, but I think I could have been happy in just about any of them. But what was the best match for me? Pediatrics, I have no regrets about going into pediatrics. I, I think that, that was a great choice for me. Pediatric emergency medicine, no question that was a great choice for me. I am very happy I, I made that as my, my final choice. So are there any specific reasons why someone should not choose your specialty? If you don't want to deal with a lot of pandemonium, uh, if you don't do well under pressure, if you don't do well having to make decisions quickly, and especially if you don't do well with irate parents, don't go into pediatric emergency medicine. We don't have a lot of irate parents. Most of them are very grateful for what we do. But about 1 in 10 to 1 in 20 um, are pretty nasty, and that takes some getting used to. Um, Andy, why don't we, why don't we uh, uh, sit down? Over, we can, you want to go down on the, on the back deck? Is that okay? Sure. All right, let's just go over here. Um, yeah, the, the um, irate parents, it just takes some takes some getting used to. Um, it's, uh, it's a difficult part of my specialty, and it's the part that I dislike the most, but it's a part of it, and it's a part of life, too. I mean, there are irate people in all walks of life. We see people screaming at waiters in restaurants every so often, too, and I always feel very sorry for those waiters and waitresses because I know what it feels like. <laughs> um, but uh, overall, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great specialty, and I'm glad I chose it. Now for the fun ones, are there any stereotypes about your specialty? Uh, well, about pediatrics, I think one of the stereotypes is that pediatrics are sort of passive, uh, um, just kind of uh, wallflowers um, that don't have any kind of a spine. 
That is definitely not a description of me or my partners. Um, you really have to have a spine if you're going to work in an ER setting, whether it's pediatric ER or adult ER. So uh, that definitely is not uh, a, a stereotype that fits the, the actual reality. Well, I guess the answer to the next question, are the stereotypes true at all? Well, there, there are personality types that are attracted to each of the various specialties. And I think the general uh, pattern I guess you'd see in pediatrics is it's people who are, are um, quiet, um, reserved, somewhat reserved, um, compassionate, love kids. Um, but there's all kinds of personality types that go into pediatrics. And I think it's, it's really difficult to say that there's any one specific stereotype that, that, that matches with, with the reality there. All righty. Well, of course, you are an attending physician at the Medical College of Georgia. And as an attending, is it true that you guys pimp residents a lot with questions? Uh, pimp is a, is a kind of a charged word. Um, do we ask difficult questions? Yes. Um, what I'm trying to do when I am teaching students, I try to use the Socratic method. Um, I try to get them to, to think through. So, for instance, a, a series of questions on not what is the best antibiotic for otitis media, but why is it the best medicine, best medicine for otitis media? And so you have to start with things like, you know, what are the most common organisms that cause otitis media? Um, and what are the resistance patterns with otitis media? Um, and based on those resistance patterns and the most common organisms, what is the best antibiotic for otitis media? Um, so I, I try to get them to think about, about what they're doing. So what those questions are really are really great and helpful for students to learn, but what's the craziest question that you've ever asked a student? Uh, uh, well, there's, there's, there's a favorite I like to ask, and it, again, it, it makes them think. Um, and it's, it's, it's sort of done a little, at least a little bit in levity also. It's not, it's not necessarily a, a really serious question, and, but it's, it's one I like to ask because it's just a fun question. So the question is, you are going to be infected with one of the four following organisms, which one do you choose? Your choices, Ebola, Lassa fever, bubonic plague, plague bacillus, and rabies. Which one are you going to choose to be infected by? We'll leave that to the viewers to ponder. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's funny, but, but uh, even junior and senior medical students uh, often choose the wrong answer. The, the right answer is pretty obvious if you think about it for a few minutes. Um, but um, many people uh, uh, don't see the obvious answer there. And again, it's, it's, to, it's to make them think. It's, it's, it's that, that's really what we should be doing anyway as, as medical professionals. We should be thinking about what we're doing, not memorizing. Exactly. So, I know you've been, you've been doing this for a while, but are you ever nervous at all coming into your shifts? Coming into my shifts, um, I, I don't think so. No, I, I, I think that um, what, what, I, what I do requires a lot of training, and I've been through a lot of, of really difficult situations in my career. Uh, sorry about the phone there. No problem. Um, and many have been very stressful. I've learned from every one of them. Um, but it hasn't scared me out of my profession. Um, it just makes me think, okay, how would I have done that differently if I had to do this again? Um, but actually being scared coming into my shifts or nervous, I, I don't think so. I, I, uh, I think that, that um, the best cure for stage fright is preparation. And for instance, I do a lot of medical legal work. And I, in fact like to do medical legal work and I especially like going to trial because it's 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 a it's almost a battle of wits the lawyer versus the expert and what I have told folks who are going into a situation like that is look um, if you're prepared for the questions you're going to be getting there's no reason to be nervous about it you know what the answers are um, if a child comes in in full arrest you know what you need to do if a child can't breathe, you know what to do. If a child is bleeding, you know what to do. So there's really no good reason to be nervous about that going into your shifts. Well said. So as 
a pediatric emergency medicine doctor, how many patients do you see on an average day? Well, in the non-COVID world, um, in our pediatric ER in, in Augusta, Georgia, uh, we're seeing on an average shift between 30 and 40. This is the non-night shifts. On the night shifts, it's, it's probably more in the range of about 15 to 20. But on the day or evening shifts, we probably average 30 to 40 patients. Um, the national average for pediatric ER docs is 2.5 patients per hour. I work nine-hour shifts. So I'm seeing, what, three to three and a half patients per hour. So our volume is a little bit higher in our pediatric ED. Uh, our acuity is also a little bit lower than the average pediatric ED. Not a lot, but a little bit lower. So we're able to see more patients. We also have great residents. So what's the most amount of patients you've seen in a day? Oh, I set my record uh, last year, the year before. In a nine-hour shift, I saw 59 patients, and that was not a fun shift. Not a fun shift at all. I, it was, I, I consider that a dangerous situation. I really don't think we should be in a situation like that. Yeah, I can't imagine. So, how many procedures do you do on an average day? Well, I'm not doing the procedures myself in most cases unless the resident or student misses it. Uh, so most of the time, I'm supervising the procedures. But we probably have, on a typical shift, uh, it's a range, probably in the range of about 5 to 15 uh, procedures per shift. Most of those are going to be sutures, but we have spinal taps, LPs. Um, we have a, the occasional intubation. We have the occasional chest tube. Um, we do a fair number of, of um, uh, incision and drainage of abscesses, um, uh, nail trephinations. Um, repairing nail bed lacerations, and you first have to take the nail after if you're going to do that. So there, that's a that's a fairly involved procedure. Um, suturing a, a, a laceration in the tongue. Thankfully, that's a relatively rare thing, and it's a very involved process. But overall, we're probably averaging about five to fifteen procedures per shift. Okay. How many hours do you work in an average week? In the ED, uh, I, a full-time attending at, at, at Medical College of Georgia is 13 shifts, 13 nine-hour shifts per month. So we're working about three to three and a half shifts per week. But we have a lot of outside responsibilities as academic physicians. I teach. I give lectures. I go to conferences. I have some administrative roles. So the total work week is about 40 to 50 hours, closer to 50, average. There are some weeks that it's much more than that. There are a few weeks where it's less than 40, but not many. Okay. More on the lifestyle side, what time do you normally wake up? It varies. We have three shifts in our pediatric ED. We have a 7 to 4 shift, we have a 3 to midnight shift, and we have an 11P to 7A shift. So it just depends on what my shifts are. Um, uh, I was on the evening shift last night. I often find it difficult when I get home at anywhere from midnight to 2 in the morning. I mean, I'm off at midnight technically. But in many cases, I can't leave right away for a variety of reasons. So I may get home anywhere from midnight to 2 in the morning. In that case, I'm not getting up until 10 or 11 o'clock the next day. Yeah. So what time do you normally leave the hospital then? Well, on an, on an evening shift, again, it's probably between midnight and 2. Um, I, I think one of the things that makes pediatric EM docs different from the general ED docs, the general ED docs... Uh, I think just accept the fact that, that we're on shifts and, and it's the end of my shift, it's the beginning of your shift, it's your time for you to take over and, and they check out and they leave. Uh, the pediatric ED docs, in my experience, and I've been in a multi multiple hospitals as an attending, um, pediatric ED docs tend to take, I think, more ownership for their patients. And so the way I refer to it as dangling ends, I don't like to leave dangling ends. If I'm in the middle of working up a patient or doing something with a patient, I'm not just going to abandon ship when the end of my shift comes around. I'm going to finish up what I'm doing. And that can sometimes take a couple of hours. The unfortunate part about that is that the only person that knows I've done that is me. Um, we don't have a time clock we, that we punch. Uh, nobody knows that I spent those extra two hours there other than me and my patient. But that's all that matters to me. Okay. How many hours of sleep are you typically working on then? I try to get at least six hours sleep uh, every day or every night. So how many um, hours I don't of sleep? Always, I'm not always successful with that. Um, there are some nights where I have to get in for an early meeting, and I may I may get less than that. There 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 
somewhere I've I've had for a variety of reasons I've I've had virtually no time to get anything done ahead of time and I have to pull um, an all nighter to prepare for something the next day. So I have I have had some where I've had to come in the next day with only one hour sleep. Not for shift. I never ever go in for an ED shift without enough sleep ever. That is a really hard and fast rule for me. I don't drink on the day that I have a shift. Alcohol that is. I don't drink any alcohol the day of a shift. Um, and I don't go into a shift without enough sleep. It's perfect. So I guess since this is break, I guess break in quotations, mm -hmm. uh, how many hours of sleep are you working on right now? I got home at midnight last night, New Year's Eve. I got actually home at one minute before midnight, just in time to give my wife a kiss as the clock ticked midnight. Um, and then we, uh, we have some relatives over, so we end up staying up and watching TV for a few hours. So um, I, I'm working on about eight hours sleep today. We got up, we got up late. Okay. So do you have to take call at all? Technically, we take call. Uh, what that means is if, if things get really crazy, hey Murph, if things get really crazy um, in the hospital, uh, you know, a plane crashes or the, you know, there, there's a train wreck or something horrible happens, there's a horrible tornado that smashes into multiple buildings, technically there is a need for more people. Yes, we need to go in and, and help. That almost never happens. I don't think I have ever um, had to come in for a disaster. Um, I've been there when disasters have hit before, but I don't think I've ever had to come in for a disaster. Um, but the main purpose for call for us is if somebody can't come into their shift because they're sick. And have I gone in on those days? Yes. Not often, probably only once or twice a year because most of our docs, most of our partners are really conscientious about making sure that if they have any means at all to go to work, they go. Um, the hard and fast rule for us is if you're running a fever, do not go and, and, and don't, don't try to be a, a soldier there. If you've got a fever, you stay home. Don't go in and, and infect the nurses and the patients. All right. Do you prefer night or day shift? I prefer the day shift. Um, I do not like the overnights. Um, I, I, I mean, there's, there's actually some research out there showing that night shifts, overnight shifts, are detrimental to your health. Uh, and luckily, I've been able to avoid them most of my career. We didn't do overnight shifts at our hospital until about four years ago. So most of my career, I haven't had to do overnight shifts. I did more as a resident than I've done since then. But um, it's not fun having to go in at 11 o'clock at night when all your family's about to go to bed, you're walking out the door to go for a eight-hour shift. That is not a fun thing. Um, I've gotten used to it, um, and there are some things about it that I actually do like. Uh, for instance, you're guaranteed not to get 59 patients in your shift. It just doesn't get that busy on an overnight. So the overnight shifts are not nearly as busy, and it gives you time to get to know the nurses better, get to know your residents and students a little bit better, uh, just shoot the breeze, uh, maybe do some online uh, work, uh, take a look at some some uh, articles that you wanted to get caught up on, um, get, get some email taken care of. So there, there are opportunities during the night shift where you can do all that. It still doesn't float my boat. I would rather not have to do night shifts, but it's just a part of the job. So speaking of part of the job, how long does it take you to chart at the end of the day? Since we went to electronic charting, and that was about six or seven years ago, um, which, let me just put in this little plug here, was one of the stupidest things that our government has ever mandated. Um, it's been horrible. The electronic records are awful. When we were doing written records, I was able to get my, my charts done. Pretty much before I left the hospital, I could get my charting done. Um, and I didn't stay late. I did my charting as I went. It is impossible, at least in my uh, experience, uh, in the academic world, to get my charts done contemporaneously with the work. It's just not possible. And I find that it takes an average of about two hours extra work after I leave the hospital to do the charting for a variety of reasons. The main reason being that the residents haven't finished the charts. And until the residents and students have finished the charts, I can't touch it. So the charting is, is a nightmare for us. And it's largely the doing of the federal government. So who are you most thankful for on your care team? Most thankful for on the care team? Oh, the nurses. Uh, I mean, I, I learned a long time ago that the nurses are the glue that hold, our, 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 hold everything together. Um, we, we, are, we have different skill sets. The physicians have certain uh, 
responsibilities, certain roles to play, and the nurses have certain responsibilities and roles to play. Um, I think uh, the nurses could get by without the docs in many situations. The docs would have a very difficult time getting by without the nurses. I think the nurses are by far the most important part of our, our care team. Right. So what's the funniest thing you've seen in a patient chart without violating HIPAA, of course? Funniest thing in a patient chart? Um, maybe names. I mean, we, we see some crazy names. But other than that, um, I mean, there's some crazy chief complaints sometimes, but I, I, I can't even think of them off the top of my head right now. But the names are probably what would jump out at me. So what's the most common medical advice you give to your patients? The fever talk. Um, I'm in pediatrics. Much of what we see in pediatrics is kids with infections of some sort or another, mostly viral, and many of them have fevers. So, uh, which is why, by the way, the infectious disease background has helped me so much in my, in my, uh, in my career. Um, so just discussing with parents not to worry about the fever that the fever is actually a good thing. It helps to fight off the viruses and the bacteria, makes the child uncomfortable, and that's why we recommend the Tylenol or the Motrin, but it's not critical to bring that temperature down uh, other than for comfort. Um, so it's the, the fever talk is probably one of the most common, common talks I give parents.